Hello and welcome back to All Hallows, where today we're thinking about the opening verses of John chapter 12, where Jesus visits his friends Mary, Martha and Lazarus. And so today, as we do indeed enter the house of Mary, Martha and Lazarus, you enter a scene in which all of your senses are engaged and stimulated. There's a smell of a meal being prepared. It pervades your nose and you breathe in deeply. There's a noise and the chatter of those who are gathered together. It reaches your ears and you smile as you hear it. There's a sight of many people enjoying themselves, celebrating, greeting your eyes. You touch the table in which Jesus, Lazarus, and all of those gathered are reclining as you pass by and know that it will not be long until you too eat of the meal that's being prepared. There's a real festival air <clears throat> in this house and only recently the mood was so different as Mary and Martha mourned their brother who lay in his tomb. They had sent word to their dear friend Jesus saying, the one whom you love is ill. But Jesus, rather than coming straight away, stayed where he was for a further two days. And when he did make his way to Bethany, he discovered that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. Martha was distraught when she greeted Jesus, scolding him, saying, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But then going on to declare that, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the son of God who was to come into the world. And as Mary and Martha took Jesus to the place where Lazarus lay, Jesus wept. He wept for the friend whom he loved and had lost. He wept for the friend who now lay dead and buried in his tomb for the past four days. But Jesus, Lord of the living and the dead, ordered that the stone be rolled away and commanded Lazarus come out. And the dead was indeed raised to life. Lazarus was resurrected and given back to his sisters. And it's now no wonder that a meal is being given in Jesus's honour. But in just a week's time, another tomb would be occupied by one of those around this table. As this time, the visit that Jesus is making to Mary, Martha and Lazarus is on the eve of his very own triumphant entry into Jerusalem. The very beginning of his last week on earth, which would culminate in the desolate Sabbath of mourning for Jesus, the one who today is being so celebrated. But here and now, in this house, in the familiarity of being surrounded by friends, it is a friendship that is being celebrated. Jesus knew this house as a place of rest, welcome and sanctuary, along with the value, the importance and the cost of friendship. This is where somewhere where Jesus could possibly have been himself, away from the crowds who sought him away from the sick who wanted him and the needy who always followed him. There's little indication in this gospel account that Jesus was doing anything other than enjoying the company of those closest to him. Maybe hearing from Lazarus his very own experience of being raised from the dead. In the coming days, Jesus was to know that even the closest of friendships do not always remain loyal. Betrayal is possible for even the most ardent of his supporters this week, as many of those closest to him will run in fear and disown him. But for now, the atmosphere is in contrast to that. In contrast to the one that we shared with Mary and Martha just two weeks ago when we last visited their home. This is one of a relaxed air. Martha is not telling Jesus off because he's not telling 
Mary, that she should be helping her. But Mary still has Jesus's feet in mind. And the festival air, the gaiety of the opening verses, the relaxed nature is soon overshadowed by the actions of Mary as before your very eyes and under your very nose. Mary slips into the room, perhaps unnoticed by the men who are in deep conversation. And she kneels behind Jesus and she takes his feet into her hands. Jesus is weary, tired and dirty feet. Feet that had walked for miles. Feet that had evidence etched into their skin and under the very finger and under the very nails. These are feet that had walked on water as well as on land. And Mary washes them. Not with the ceremonial water from the jars by the door, but with a perfume so rich and beautiful that she hadn't even used it to anoint her own brother's body when it lay in the tomb. And as Mary pours this perfume onto Jesus's feet, the house is filled with a scent emitting from the jar, emitting from Jesus's feet and from Mary's hands. It gets into your nose and it hits the back of your throat. But what sticks there is not the act of love, but rather the embarrassment that you see. This is nothing to do, I'm sorry, Mary has nothing to dry them with and commits another social sin. And she lets down her hair and uses that as a towel. The very fact that John tells us Jesus needed his feet dried conveys the amount of liquid that Mary had used as she washed them. And in contrast to Mary's outpouring of generosity, Judas displays his lack of understanding and maybe gives voice to the embarrassment of so many in the room as he points to the material value and the waste of the generous act. And he receives a stern rebuke from Jesus that will come to pass sooner than any of them in the room realise and imagine. As Jesus says, Leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. So what to take from this familiar, disturbing account today? This scene of great joy and great complexity when does our lack of understanding prevent God's work being done or recognised? When are we so disturbed by such an outpouring of love for God that rather than rejoice in it, we are embarrassed and conflicted? Reclining at the table is not something that we do in the 21st century. Rather, we tend to sit formally together but depicted here, reclining at the table would have been more like lying around it, with a low table at the head end. And knowing this gives us a greater understanding of how Mary was able to carry out her actions and have such easy access to Jesus's feet in her intimate gesture of love and adoration. <clears throat> Events that have just unfolded in Mary, Martha and Lazarus' house, we'll find echoes later in the week as Jesus and his disciples gather around another table for another meal, after which it will be Jesus who takes the feet of the disciples into his hands and washes them. The discomfort that the disciples are experiencing today as they see Mary's act of love literally poured out upon Jesus, will revisit them, as it becomes they who have their feet washed by Jesus. And Peter, for his part, wants his hands and his head washed also 
in preparation for his denial of Christ. The friendship that Jesus is in receipt of in the house of his friends today, he will demonstrate to others in an ultimate act of love and sacrifice on the cross. But then, as now, Judas does not understand. He has had a ringside seat to Jesus's ministry. He has been entrusted by Jesus and sent out to do good works. He has been entrusted with the collective purse. But Judas doesn't know the real value of friendship and life in Christ. He doesn't see beyond the monetary value of the kingdom of God, which cannot be bought. The fragrance emitted from Jesus doesn't enter Judas's nose or his body. He doesn't understand. His eyes and his heart are closed, unlike Mary's, whose are fully open. Judas's apparent act of love towards Jesus later this week will be so very different to Mary's act of love. Amen.